Good morning, everyone. Good morning, St. Louis. Uh, we are live uh, from headquartered from downtown St. Louis at our CPA firm, Anders CPAs and Advisors. Uh, we are 200 plus people serving clients across the United States. A lot of uh, what's going on out there is affecting our clients. So we are trying to stay on top of the COVID-19 crisis and the CARES Act and everything that relates to uh, small businesses. So we have a couple panelists today that I'm going to uh, introduce. Uh, but before I do that, I want to let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared on our COVID-19 Resource Center at andrewcpa.com. So you will, will be able to share that and view that after the fact. So uh, we have our one of our panelists uh, that isn't shown is Dave Finkling. He's one of our tax partners and he is going to be our question and answer moderator. So there is a, a Q&A feature in the webinar where you can ask questions that will be answered as the webinar is uh, going on. Uh, Jeannie D is one of our uh, not-for-profit partners. She handles our not-for-profit not niche here at the firm and she has a lot of for-profit clients. So she brings a lot of experience to the panelists. Paul Ray is a, a director of our advisory services department. Paul has spent the last 33 years in banking, so he brings a unique perspective to the CARES Act and the, the loans that everybody's interested in. And then we have Dan Schindler. He's a senior tax manager at Anders, and he has uh, been the one that has uh, dove into the CARES Act and tried to understand all the specifics related to it, some of which are straightforward and some have been gray areas. And as every day goes by, we try to clear up as many gray areas as we can. So this is our second webinar. The first webinar we had last week, it was only uh, a couple days after the CARES Act was actually signed. Since then, there's been a lot of updates since then. And when I say updates, I mean gray areas that have been clarified. So uh, I think banks have learned a lot since then. We've learned a lot since then. And today we're here to share more information that we've learned so that we can uh, all continue to push forward and try to get past this short term crisis. So um, with that, uh, we'll get started with the questions. Uh, this is set up to be kind of a question and answer uh, slide deck so that we cover all the angles and, and so that um, you guys can understand what's pertinent out there, what clients and small businesses are asking and the answers related to that so that we can all make our decisions uh, about how we handle each part of the CARES Act and of course uh, the loans and working with our bankers. So um, the first question is for Dan Schindler, uh, tax, senior tax manager. Dan, what are the key aspects of the CARES Act that will lead to immediate or very near cash flow for my business or my employees? Well, I think as this whole stimulus package was put together, um, it was really centered around helping employees through this tough time given the, the economic shutdown that we are essentially in. So what this $350 million or $2 trillion stimulus package uh, is centered around is, is getting, that, getting that cash into the economy so that we can help sustain um, where we were and not, not try to go too much further. So cash is king. What can we do to help our cash flow, um, whether it's individually or or from a for your business? Uh, first, for individuals, as you probably all know, there are stimulus checks that will be um, apparently sent out in the first wave, sent out in the next three weeks or so. We'll see if that uh, time frame actually happens or not, but that's what they're saying. For single taxpayers, you will get a $1,200 stimulus check if your AGI is under 75,000. At 75,000, it starts to phase out. Um, for married filing joint taxpayers, the phase out is 150,000 AGI, and the stimulus check amount is uh, 2,400. You also will get $500 for each dependent child you have. So th the planning opportunity comes into play here because the stimulus check is based on your 2019 tax return if it has been filed. If it has not been filed, it's based on your 2018 tax return. So if you have uh, income spikes or income drops, you may want to time when you file your 19 return to make sure you take advantage of the, the full stimulus check amount. Also, 
RMDs for those who take retire or required minimum distributions that is suspended for 2020. No one is required to take an RMD and it could be particularly beneficial if you don't need the cash with the market being um, down quite a bit uh, of late. It, it may not make sense to to liquidate those funds and take a distribution if it's not needed. Additionally, uh, on the line of retirement plans, there is generally a 10% additional tax on retirement plan distributions um, if you take them before you are 59 and a half. However, for 2020, um, you can take an early retirement plan distribution. It is not subject to uh, the 10% penalty. And if it's what's deemed a coronavirus, coronavirus related distribution, it the income and tax on that income can be spread over a three year period starting in, in 2020. So you would spread out the tax you pay on that early distribution. And I do want to note you can only take up to one hundred thousand um, dollars in a coronavirus related distribution. Um, switching gears a little bit to the business side, the Qualified improvement property is now eligible or, or now has a 15 year depreciable life when the tax cuts and jobs act tax cuts and jobs act passed in 2017. It there, there was an error and it omit the 15 year depreciable life, which resulted in qualified improvement property being depreciated over 39 years. The cares act had a technical correction to that retroactive to 2017 or you know September of 2017 when it was in effect. So you can actually go back and amend 18 or 19 tax returns if filed and take additional depreciation bonus depreciation on qualified improvement property that you may have otherwise been depreciating over 39 years. Again, a lot of these stipulations and provisions are to help get cash in the hands of individuals and businesses. So you can go back and amend returns to recoup some some taxes paid in prior years um, rather than having to wait 39 years to, to write this off. Also business loss limitations that were in effect due to, to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It was a $500,000 loss for married filing joint taxpayers. Um, so basically if you had an active business loss, it could not exceed $500,000. The, the remaining would carry forward. However, that is now uh, suspended as well and actually suspended retroactively in, uh, as well too. So in 2018, 2019 and 2020, you can actually utilize your full active business losses, even if it exceeds $500,000. Along the same token, net operating losses. So if you kind of go back and amend returns for, for reasons that I just discussed, you may create net operating losses. If you do, if you generate a net operating loss in 2018, 2019 or 2020, you can now carry that NOL back five years to recoup some taxes paid in previous years rather than have to carry it forward. Um, there's there's a handful of other provisions related to, to individual and business taxes. I know that's probably not at the, the top of the list. Uh, I, I suspect these PPP loans are going to be the hot topic, so I, I won't uh, touch base on any of the others unless it is desired. Thank you. One, Dan, other, one other thing as well, actually, uh, sorry to interrupt, Dan, is to help uh, with cash flow. Businesses can talk to their bank and consider if consider whether you can defer loan payments on existing loans. I know for SBA loans, there's there's a potentially a three or six month deferral, but talk to your bank if you have any existing loans. See what they'll see how they'll work with you and uh, p potentially defer some of the uh, the current month's payments. Additionally, for individuals, talk with your bank, talk with your mortgage um, lender to see if they're offering anything in regards to mortgage deferments, all just to kind of keep more cash in your pocket now. You'll ultimately have to pay it, obviously, but, but just to kind of kick the can down the road and, and see if there's any uh, cushion you can get from a cash flow perspective. Thank you, Dan Schindler. Uh, the whole the whole point of everything uh, in the CARES Act and everything that he just mentioned is so that um, everyone, small businesses and individuals can keep cash in their pockets to survive this short term crisis. And we all do hope it's short term. Uh, before we go to the next question, Paul, do you want to add anything from a banking perspective? 
Yeah, just a couple of quick things. First of all, I mentioned this last week. We, we're blessed in the St. Louis metropolitan area with a lot of great banks and a lot of great bankers, and they're just trying to get their hands around this as well. It's been quite the challenge, as you can imagine. Uh, I would uh, continue to advise stay close to your banker. Dan mentioned the loan deferments, especially on SBA current products. But when your employees are experiencing issues, if they're talking to you, um, as Dan mentioned earlier, make sure they're discussing with their mortgage companies. There are a couple different options out there. They can defer payments, but one of the things you want to be careful of, there are some mortgage companies out there that are deferring the payments and then turning it into a balloon payment at the end of 90 days. Well, that's great. I get, I get to not make a payment for three months and then I get to make a huge payment. That's typically not where you want to go. Most of the mortgage companies are allowing you to defer it, move it to the end of the loan. So make sure that your employees understand that if they have some, some direct questions. So I think at this point, communication uh, with your banker is the most important thing that you can do. Appreciate that. Uh, if we can go uh, to question two. So, so go ahead. So um, there have been some gray areas in the past. Some have been cleared up recently. So what previous gray areas of the Paycheck Protection Program PPP loan have been clarified? Dan Schindler. So as Dan Mudd just said and alluded to at the very beginning, there have been a lot of gray areas that we are hoping for more clarity. We have received uh, some clarification, I guess it might've been two, two nights ago, um, in regards to some very common questions in terms of how do we calculate our maximum loan cost with the, the PPP loan program? Um, there was a, a, a group of people, and, and I was probably included it to a certain extent, that thought we used net wages originally. However, the Treasury has come out and explicitly said we are to use gross wages, not net wages. So that's clearly an advantage for, for businesses because it, it just doesn't really make sense why we would have ever used net wages. But that's how the law appeared to read. Um, but we've got clarification that, that is it is gross wages. The $100,000 compensation threshold, there was some uncertainties as it related to did that threshold incorporate salaries, wages, commissions, as well as retirement plan contributions and, and health insurance benefits? Or was that $100,000 threshold just on salaries and wages? It has been clarified that $100,000 threshold is just on cash compensation. So if someone were to make $100,000 for the year, you, you would include their prorated portion of that $100,000 in addition to adding the retirement plan contributions and health insurance benefits. Independent contractors, those who, who you issue 1099s to, um, there was, when the interim final ruling came out from the Treasury, they contradict, contradicted themselves in that same ruling. Um, one part said you do include independent contractors and one part said you didn't. So that created more questions. The other night we did get clarification, for now at least, that independent contractors are not included in your payroll costs, not in the payroll wages or co the compensation amount, nor the employee headcount. Then and that is, let me interject real quick, and that's because they're going to be those independent contractors are going to be filing their own PPP loan, correct? Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. And, and we'll we'll touch on that a little later, but yes, that's exactly right, Dan. That that there is no double dipping allowed here, so you can't include these independent contractors because they're going to be able to apply on their own anyway. Um, then there was some confusion or, or debates and, and what do you use for the average payroll calculation? Do you use calendar year 2019? Do you use the, the trailing 12 months? There was a lot of uh, questions out there regarding that, um, but you can use either essentially. So you, you can you can choose what you would what you would prefer to use. Um, if you finished your first quarter 2020 payroll reports, go ahead and use the last 12 last 12 months. Um, and further, which this next topic has not been clarified, we hope to get clarification soon, is do guarantee payments count for partnerships? Do partnership um, distributions and shareholder, S-Corp shareholder distributions count? Uh, does box one ordinary income for partnerships count? What we do know is, is at least a, a bank or two in the area has been 
including self-employment K-1 income from box 14A. So if, you, if you're a partner in a partnership and get your K-1, um, you, you generally have some sort of income or loss in box one. You, you may or may not have guaranteed payments, but box 14A includes your, your net or your self-employment income. It is our understanding that some banks are including that now in payroll costs, um, which is clearly advantageous. However, we are still looking for a little bit more definitive answers from the Treasury on that. And, and I would like to think it comes in the next uh, few days or before the end of the week. Thank you, Dan Schindler. Um, as you can see, there were a lot of gray areas. There's less today than there was yesterday, and, and hopefully tomorrow we'll have additional ones uh, cleared up. Um, our clients and uh, Anders as well, we've been all working with our banking partners to get all of these cleared up. We're trying to get ap applications in in a timely and efficient manner so that it is a complete package and it doesn't have to be redone or they don't have to come back and ask for more backup. Um, whatever period you use for the average payroll calculation, just make sure your backup matches that, right? Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. Yeah, you'll need to support all the document. All you'll need to support all the numbers on your loan application in, in some fashion. Sounds good. Paul, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just add one thing. Uh, if you have a question, follow the guidance from your bank. They're going to have spreadsheets, things of that nature. Don't leave anything blank. Don't leave anything blank on the application. Communicate with your banker uh, to make sure they help you determine the way around those gray areas or, or how you work through that. If you leave it blank, it may just get kicked out. So work hard to, to leave, uh, get everything filled in. If you need communication, bankers where you go to. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, question three, please. So regarding the PPP loan forgiveness, will there be an audit at some point on how the loan proceeds were used? That question's for Paul. Yeah, you know, I smile a little bit when I I read that because I, I know actually there's one person on our call that uh, is, uh, was a former regulator, so he's probably scratching his head. So I hope I answer this correctly, but I would tell you that um, no matter what you do, we're not sure how the end of the program is going to specifically uh, work out. We do know there's going to be a document where you're going to have to sort of declare to the bank and the SBA that you followed all those guidelines. We know there will be some information that will be required at that point in time. I would just encourage you to either have a separate checking account that some banks are advising you to do, or if you use your uh, existing checking account and commingle the funds. We always get nervous with that word commingle, but make sure you've kept appropriate records moving forward. Whether or not they ask for that at the end, we suspect there will be something along those lines. But be prepared and expect sort of the 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 worst as far as what you're going to have to provide. We that have worked with the Treasury and the SBA for years know that um, you know there you don't want to run afoul of that. You may not have to offer a lot of things at the end, but be prepared with your records. Uh, and I think, Dan, that's the best advice that we could offer. I agree with that, yes. Uh, question four, please. How do I ensure that 100% of the PPP loan will be forgiven? Paul, that's also for you. Well, I, I think I just touched on the record keeping. Make sure that you keep the appropriate records. Make sure you're spending 75% of that in payroll costs and the other 25 interest on loans, uh, whether it's your commercial mortgage or, you know, there's been a little bit of a differencing of opinion on the third point, but it clearly says in the final interim, which I'm still not sure how you get comfortable around something that says interim final, uh, but you can use it for other debts that were um, created prior to the covered period. You can use it for rent, you can use it for utilities. So if you stay within that 75%, 25% guideline, that, and you can uh, appropriately uh, produce the records uh, to prove it, it should be 100% forgiven. That's the purpose of the whole program. So um, I wouldn't lose a significant amount of sleep uh, around that. Uh, you know, the spirit of the law from the very beginning was uh, designed to really get these loans forgiven. It's not a gotcha. They're not looking for reasons to to require that the bank is stuck with a two-year 1% loan. They want these things forgiven. So do the right thing and you don't have anything to worry about. I'll interject with one thing there, Paul. 
Um, in order to ensure that 100% PPP loan forgiveness, there are some reduction clauses that, that we'll need to keep our eyes on. Um, as we, we've stated previously, the, the underlying purpose of this whole stimulus package is to keep people employed, keep dollars in their hands. So if you're to get this PPP loan and want it 100% forgiven, you also have to maintain um, your same level of full-time equivalent employment. And you have to maintain salaries and wages comparable to what you had in the prior year. So, so you'll, you'll want to look at your full-time equivalents during that eight-week period um, after you get the loan and make sure your full-time equivalents are equal to or greater than what your full-time equivalents were from January 1, 2020 to February 9th, 2020, or at your election, you can choose uh, February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. You'll want to take the lower of those two numbers so that you can have that higher, uh, meet that full-time equivalent uh, threshold, but you have the option to include um, either or when looking at your full-time equivalents in, in this regard. Thank you, thank you. Um, I know we talked about one example of, of record keeping and it was thrown, and there's many obviously, but one was uh, maybe you create a separate bank, a new bank account uh, to take the loan proceeds in so you can track all all the expenses that you pay out of it um, and that, that are, they're not commingled with your regular small business operating account, which probably has a lot of transactions. We're not saying that you have to pay your payroll out of that new account. You can just transfer money from the one account to the other when payroll is due. But it's just an example of thinking outside the box and what I can do to make my life easier down the road when they do come looking at how I did spend the money. Paul, you have anything to add on that? No, I think that's it, Dan. Thanks. Uh, we, we do have some question and answer coming in online and uh, we are we are answering those as we go here uh, with uh, Dave Finkling, our tax moderator. Uh, so keep the questions coming in uh, through the the Q&A function of the webinar and we'll continue on with our uh, Q&A format here. So question five, what is the economic injury disaster loan, the EIDL, and should businesses apply for this loan and the PPP loan? Paul, that's for you. Hey Dan, I'm, I'm gonna make a quick answer to that and then I'll think we'll go on to question six because that will explain, we'll have an opportunity to explain the more in detail, but I guess the word should and could could be interchanged here. You certainly can apply for both. And in most instances, that makes sense. Uh, the EIDL has a little more mystery to it at this moment, uh, and we'll kind of cover the difference between the two. I'm not aware of anyone that's been funded on that yet. Um, so I guess the, the question, should you? That's an individual opinion. Could you absolutely apply for both? But we'll talk in a moment uh, in a little more detail about what you shouldn't use it for uh, from a duplication perspective. So maybe we click to question six, and I think that probably flows in the difference between the two. Let me just sure. back up for a moment and sort of put, put it this way. On the left-hand side, we have the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and that's been around for quite a few years in one way, shape, or form. That's directly through the SBA, that's directly online. The SBA is the administrator of that. They're also the lender on that. And it, it originally was designed for local disasters, uh, tornadoes, floods, those types of things. Uh, and it, it provided a really working capital, things of that nature. There were a lot of stipulations on it. But it is an actual loan. It's it's not a forgiveness type loan on the PPP loan that we'll cover in just a moment. So you apply for this online. Two weeks ago, it was a nightmare to get in and apply because it was the old version. They updated that as of, I believe, Sunday of last week. It became more of a streamlined program. Go in, point and click, upload a few things. And part of that was a $10,000 advance or grant, they're using those inter interchangeably. But let's say you, you apply for $150,000 for the EIDL loan and you, you're approved for 150, you also have a choice while you're applying to receive a $10,000 advance on that particular loan. Uh, that's supposed to get you to you in three to five days. 
Again, I have yet to hear anyone that's gotten that money in three to five days. I would encourage if you have, I'd love to hear from you out on our website. Um, my email address is there. I'd love to hear from you if you've gotten that or you've gotten an EIDL loan completely approved and funded at this particular time. You can use that for working capital. It's, it's more broad. Uh, there are guarantees associated with that, so you, you you may have to guarantee the loan depending on the dollar amount. There have been some recent changes there within the last 48 hours, um, and it uh, does have a 3.75 uh, interest rate. The terms can be 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They will determine that term for you. We have seen uh, potentially those things go out to 30 years on some of the larger loans. So that's literally just a loan. That's kind of the, the left side. If you come over to the right side, the one that's getting all of the publicity and all of the press rolled out shortly after the, the EIDL uh, sort of got to everyone's attention from the media. The Paycheck Protection Program, as soon as the, uh, the stimulus package was approved, it was blasted out there. Banks didn't have guidance. Uh, accounting firms didn't have guidance, lawyers didn't have, so it was really a challenge. The, the, we use a banker's term, it was sort of clunky. It's gotten less clunky now and banks are starting to get uh, their hands around this. And it literally is a loan that's administered by the SBA, but it's through your bank. So you're gonna apply through your bank, you're gonna base it on two and a half times payroll costs. We've went through a lot of those. There's a lot of information out on our website that will tell you all of those payroll costs that you can include. We could spend five hours talking about those types of things. But the biggest piece on the payroll protection program is it's forgivable. So why are we hearing that there are things on the EIDL loan that's forgivable? Well, that $10,000 advance really is a grant and it's forgivable. Even if you're turned down for the EIDL loan, it's forgivable. If for some reason you used payroll uh, through that and you were lucky enough to get the EIDL first, you can take that portion and, and refinance it over to the PPP loan, but you're going to get forgiveness over that payroll piece. So you want to be real cautious about that. I think that's become less of an issue because I don't think there are any that are really getting dispersed out there at this point. Really believe the uh, PPP loans will be funded before most of the EIDL loans. The IDL loan, as we just spoke a moment ago, it has forgiveness to it. And if you pay attention to the guidelines about forgiveness, it will be forgiven, a process at the end of June 30th, given a period of time, verification, SBA at some point in time will turn around, write a check back to the bank for a fee for their, uh, for their processing it. That's not a fee that the bank will pass to you. Um, that's a fee paid to them uh, by the SBA. So it, it sounds simple. I think it's getting more simple. I honestly believe that the folks that are applying Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week are feeling a little better than the folks that even applied on Friday. That was sort of a crazy day and not sure that that was the wisest decision to make that a deadline. So uh, Dan, that's kind of the high level differences. I probably got a little bit into the weeds, but we've done this a lot and clients are interested in it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. I know that, um, again, a lot of the gray areas have been cleared up, uh, as well as uh, there's a lot of uh, places that you can find uh, frequent, frequently asked question and answer sites. Um, we do have one of those FAQs on our COVID-19 Resource Center at andrewcpa.com. I saw last night that the AICPA uh, put one out as well on some of the gray, the, the gray areas for the PPP loan. Uh, that are now cleared up, clarified, and have answers to them. So the information is getting out there. We are clearing up a lot of these gray areas, which helps make everything run a little bit uh, faster and efficient uh, compared to when, when the doors opened, which, uh, you know, wasn't too, too long ago. And I think last week's webinar, uh, we alluded to the fact that, that since there were so many gray areas that we, we kind of cautioned people to hold on to their applications and then wait till these gray areas got cleared up so that they could submit a, a good package without having to redo it. And we do know that some clients had to redo it when some of these things got clarified. So um, knowing that, I just encourage you to, to reach out uh, to any of the websites out there, AICPA, our website. Uh, I, I think some of the banks are even coming out with some of the, the FAQs, which provides a lot of uh, guidance. Why don't we move on to question seven? 
So how do I apply for the loans and what businesses qualify for the loans? And that's probably going to be a dual answer from Paul and maybe even Jeannie D. So okay. Paul, well, why don't you start with that? I'll take it first. Uh, you know, I've used up a lot of chips with bankers. I had a lot built up over the years, but I think I've used all that up the last week and a half. I've talked to a lot of bankers and and frankly, the you have banks doing it different ways, but they're getting to the same result and building in some consistency. A, a larger bank is probably going to have uh, the application online. You're going to fill it out. You're going to go into a portal, into an underwriting center. It's going to get approved moving forward from there. Some of the community banks may have it online, uh, but it may be a, uh, a PDF file where you download the application after you've filled it in, uh, put all this information together, uh, scan it and email it directly to the bank. Uh, I have heard people walking up where the bank lobbies are closed, but putting them in envelopes and stuffing them underneath the door. I wouldn't suggest that, but that happens. And then some of the smaller banks, it's in-person applications at, at a distance. I wouldn't suggest that either. I would tell you that the online function seems to be the way that most of the banks are allowing this. You're going to fill out the application, uh, supply in the information they need, and I would encourage you to make sure you have all of that information together at one time so that it uh, it can't get lost. Uh, and, and frankly, there's going to be a lot of shuffling out there, so make sure it's all together. So I think the second half of the question, Dan, really uh, was put out there because what businesses qualify for the loan? So let's just, I'm going to simply just take the application and this has changed five times, but it, <laughs> it says sole proprietorships, partnerships, C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, independent contractors, eligible self-employed individuals, 501C3 not-for-profits, 501C19 veteran organizations, tribal businesses, which are section three, uh, B2C of the Small Business Act, and then it says other. So if you're an other, make sure you're communicating with your bank uh, from that perspective so that you really realize if other actually classifies. I think that's obviously a catch all. You have to have 500 or less employees with the caveat, and this has sort of been something that's went below the, went below the, the, the screen here a little bit. There are businesses that can have more than 500 employees and that's part of the uh, SBA uh, 7, or actually, I guess it's SBA 3, that there are companies that will qualify if they're, they have a net income qualifying factor test uh, or a net worth test. And I don't want to get too much into that. You can go out and look at Section 3 in the SBA. We haven't seen anyone at this moment. What that typically does in some smaller towns that have factories that maybe are uh, lower wages, they may have eight, nine hundred employees, but their net worth test uh, and their income test uh, for the size of their business they qualify. So we wouldn't want folks to think if it's more than 500, we're completely out, but it's somewhat of a rarity, but that test is there. So I wanted to make sure we went over that. Appreciate that, Paul. Um, and Jeannie, he answered the question about the nonprofit, and I know later on in the slide deck, there's uh, specific questions about nonprofits. So we'll We'll just keep moving on for now. Uh, question eight, please. Is the EIDL $10,000 advance really a grant and what happens if I get turned down? Can I still apply for the PPP in that instance? I think you talked about this, but if you wanna um, update or, or add on to your previous answer. Absolutely, and I hope I'm getting paid by the slide here. I'm, I'm uh, spending a lot of time on these things, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I did earlier, but let me clarify. The EIDL is an advance, but it really turns into a grant. If you actually get turned down for the EIDL, and some folks were saying, well, how can I do that? The EIDL has some underwriting that's different than the PPP loan. So there is a chance that you may be turned down for the EIDL. And if you've already received that $10,000, that's a grant, that's yours. Uh, you don't have to apply that back to the SBA. And then the second question, can I still apply for the PPP in that instance? Absolutely, just communicate with your banker if you've been turned down because there are reasons that you may have gotten turned down that will apply in the, the PPP application, which is sort of a coverall and it has things to do with committing felonies in the past. Although there, there's some guidance on the website uh, from the, the US Treasury Department said that's not necessarily the case. So. You don't have to always take no for an answer. Uh, there are some other things in there that as soon as you check that box, 
the application will tell you absolutely no. Um, and in most cases, that's true, but there are some, there is some wiggle room around a few things there. But if you were turned down for other reasons than that, uh, the PPP loan may, may fly right through for you. So not only should you, or could you apply for it, you should apply for it. Thanks, Hope Paul. That question, Dan. Thanks, Paul. Um, man, as you can see, some of the details and specifics with these loans and the CARES Act are just, it's almost beyond the average person to understand. So um, we're all of us are trying to pull our heads together and resources to try to understand it and, and, and work with the small businesses so that we can get these loans processed as soon as possible, get money in the hands of the small business so that they can retain their employees and survive in this short-term crisis. And so that when the crisis is over, the employee, the employees and the business will be ready to start work the next day and hopefully get back to the new normal. But what we, I mean, that's what the funds are for. They're for the employees and to keep them um, on salary while everybody's being quarantined. So with that, uh, let's keep moving. Question nine, should I be concerned if I haven't applied yet? And if I have already applied, how long does the whole process take to be approved and funded? Paul, I think uh, that ends up in your bucket as well. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I would I would tell you not to be concerned if you haven't applied yet. I would also tell you, though, you, you should probably have some sense of urgency about gathering all those documents together, getting that application together moving forward. I would say if you haven't applied yet, are you behind the game? Not necessarily, um, but certainly you know, make that move towards getting it done. Early on, there are a lot of confusing factors and, and I think the banks needed a chance to, to breathe and move forward. So um, we'll talk in a minute about additional funds that we're hearing are gonna be out there. So I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep about funds running out. Um, so second question, if I've already applied, how long does the whole process take to be approved and funded? Um, there's no really good answer on that. We've already had some banks that have approved deals. Uh, I think there's still, I saw the email uh, from the SBA uh, yesterday evening, I believe, um, about holding off from the loan documentation perspective because the SBA is gonna provide some guidance around that. That may have changed in the last 24 hours. Uh, but we're we're seeing approvals happen in, in quick as three or four days. But mostly what we're hearing is an approval process around two weeks and then maybe a funding process a week after that. So from beginning to end, maybe three weeks. Um, and I've heard that from various bankers. So if you're on the phone and you've already gotten approved, wonderful. If not, it, it's coming. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, question 10, please. We'll keep moving. Okay, this question's for Dan Schindler. Uh, can you shed any light on the PPP loan affiliation tests? It seems these tests are in place to see if combined employee counts to determine if they are above or below the magic 500 employee count mark. Yes, so the, the Treasury did come out with some guidance recently to, to help clarify you know, who affiliates are, what creates affiliation. Um, and, and in general, it's entities are affiliated when they have when one has control or the power to control the other um, whether or not that power has been exercised if they have the ability to control um, or manage over the other entity there will create an affiliation there are four tests that need to be looked at one is affiliation based on ownership um, rather straightforward if you have more than 50 percent ownership in two different entities um, you are considered an affiliate. Um, then there is a affiliate, affiliation arising under stock options, convertible securities, and agreements to merge. The Treasury and SBA treat these as having a present effect and says this is power to control an affiliate or another entity. So stock options, convertible securities, agreements to merge, though those will all create affiliation they just essentially treat it as if they have been exercised. Um, then, then you have affiliation based on management. Basically, do you have a board of directors or do you have a CEO or a president that manages two entities, creates affiliation? Then affiliation based on identity of interest, that's essentially um, relatives. So if you, you, mom, dad, uh, child or sibling, 
uh, has a similar business in a similar geography, then that could create affiliation as well. However, if there's relatives that operate different, operate in different industries in the same ge geographical region, that doesn't necessarily create affiliation. So it's just generally when um, the, the siblings or relatives have a, an identical or similar uh, business in the same area. Thanks, Dan. Uh, there are a lot of different rules surrounding uh, affiliated companies um, for tax filing purposes, for retirement plan purposes. I want to I want to make sure everybody understands that these tests that are listed here in question 10 are specifically for the PPP loan because there is a requirement that they for the most part be under the 500 employee mark. So um, if you can pass these tests um, with and without your affiliation and you're below the 500 either way, then they really don't matter as long as your application or applications uh, clearly and are transparent with all the information going on in your companies and you're going to be fine either way. Just make sure your banker knows um, all, all the activity with your companies. OK, question 11, please. Can sole proprietors filing a Schedule C take advantage of these loans? Dan Schindler? Um, as guidance is right now, we, we think yes, the Schedule C sole proprietors, independent contractors are all eligible for the PPP loan. Um, and to help calculate the PPP loan for those individuals, um, we interpret the law as net Schedule C or your net self-employment income from that trader business. And that would be the net Schedule C divided by 12 times the two and a half? That's exactly how I understand it. Okay, and then you would obviously limit that to the 100,000 if it is above, but then you would also add in the the retirement match and health insurance? Correct. Okay. That, okay. That's, that, that's how I interpret it. Um, I, you know, there there's some clarity needed uh, surrounding that, but that's how I interpret it right now. Great, great. We get a lot of questions about the, the Schedule C's and the sole proprietors because they don't have employees and the PPP loan is all about uh, employee and paying staff. So uh, gr great questions and hopefully we're, we're clarifying and, and uh, keeping everything um, as transparent as possible so that we can submit applications and again, get money in the small businesses as fast as possible. Uh, next question, please. Can I still utilize the PPP loan if I have other grants that fund certain salaries? Uh, this question is for Jeannie D, uh, who heads up our nonprofit niche. OK, thanks, Dan. Yeah, we, we started seeing this question very, very recently as as uh, organizations are starting to apply for this. And and frankly, we, we don't have you know, the full answer yet. What we are advising clients at this point is, um, I think, three things. Uh, first of all, let's let's take a look at um, those salaries that are not funded by grants. So your maybe your CEO, your CFO, your development staff, uh, non-programmatic, uh, and obviously you want to look at the the you know the calculation of that. So if we can. Uh, as my colleagues have said, we, if you are applying for these, and you probably should apply for the loan and move forward with it, uh, but if we can keep that in a separate account and keep the accounting clean on what salaries we're paying out of that account versus what salaries we're paying out of our other grant programs. Secondly, you got to look at the timing of those other programs. Um, this is not something that was contemplated by the SBA. Uh, obviously, you know, not-for-profits are sort of new to this program. Um, and so there's, we're not going to get any clear indication from the SBA on their side uh, about this question. Uh, but if we look at the timing of the other grant programs that you're running, maybe you have enough time actually in your in your current budget uh, to fold in both this funding and then the other existing funding, uh, depending on where you are in the cycle. And then last but not least, I, I would, if if you really think it's going to be a concern, and by the way, it it, it may impact. For example, your your future funding on those other programs, your uh, DHHS programs, HUD programs, CSBG programs, and the like, I would probably reach out to those funders, and because they're, I'm, my assumption is they're getting a lot of these questions as well. The goal of the program, 
as, as my colleagues have said, is to get keep your organization going, keep it running, keep your people employed. So we don't think that there's any spirit of being punitive and your other agencies should respect that. They want to continue, they want you to continue your operations. So we don't have the full answer on that one, but I think if you if you keep the accounting straight and work with your other funders, my suggestion is to go for the loan, keep the funds and keep the accounting straight. And then this is gonna have to get resolved on the back end. I mean, we really just don't know uh, until the forgiveness features come into play what, what that's going to look like. Um, very good. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think you're exactly right in that um, I, I've heard a, a few nonprofits that I'm involved with, are they, they worry before they even apply because they know that some of the salaries are grant funded. And my advice to them was, let's worry about that later. Right now, you've already cut hours for some of your staff so that you can survive this short-term crisis. Get the loan and get the money, and then we'll figure out how to spend this and what to do about it later related to the grant, the grants that fund some of the salaries. Right. So again, we all just hope this is a short-term crisis and that we, we, we get through it in, in an efficient manner. And we just all need to, to keep everybody on payroll. And we all need to be patient and, and it, we will get through this for sure. And Dan, I have reached out to OMB. Uh, they are a little inundated right now, but if we get a clearer response, obviously we're going to post that. But again, it, at this point, uh, you, you know, we, we're advising to go ahead and apply for the loan because, by all means, you know, you you if you need to pay it back, you need to pay it back. But in the cash flow crunch that everybody's seeing right now, that's that's the best guidance. And then we'll deal with additional um, information from OMB or from any other funders as we get it. Perfect, thank you. Question 13, please. Okay, I have a 501c6 and a 501c3 affiliate. Can they each apply for separate programs? So, go ahead, Jeannie. Basically, yeah, yeah. I, I think the answer to this is yes. Now, so we've had a couple of questions online as well about C6s, and as my my uh, as Paul said earlier, and my colleagues have said. Uh, you know, the, the, the PPP program, this is, this is actually written into the actual CARES Act. I mean, Paul was right. It separately states specifically 501c3 and 501c19 veterans organizations. Now, the EIDL and even the, pay, uh, uh, the payroll tax credit piece, those are more broadly defined in both the original legislation and then the interim final regs that came out. They're more broadly defined as private nonprofits. So we take that to mean, and most of the professionals that we've seen are interpreting that as no, C6s cannot participate in the PPP. Um, now, even I will go one step further, the American Society of Association Executives, which is the largest lobbying group for C6s in the country, wrote a big petition to Congress to try to be retroactively included in the PPP. That hasn't moved anywhere yet. That was just done in the past couple of days. Um, so our interpretation is that, you know, C6s cannot participate. But if you, most C6s do have, or a lot do have a foundation, a scholarship foundation, a C3 affiliate. We think that it's, it's likely that you can have different affiliates apply for different, uh, different parts of the CARES Act um, to the extent that they are separate, you know, they are separate entities. Um, and as Dan was talking about earlier, the affiliate rules were kind of set up for the headcount calculation on the PPP. Um, you, there, I think the applications do ask about affiliate entities, and we're getting a lot of questions about common paymasters and those sorts of things. We, we don't know all of those details, but in theory, a C3 should be able to apply for its programs, uh, PPP or, or whatever else, and the C6 should be able to apply for the EIDL, payroll tax, um, uh, payroll credit. tax credit programs, right, and the like. So I think the, the best thing you can do is again work with the bankers um, and and move forward applying for those programs that you're eligible for. Thanks, Jeannie. Before we go to the next question, um, there was a question online which I just there's been a lot online actually, uh, which we're answering as we go. But this one I, I wanted to highlight. So if you've already submitted your PPP loan to your banker and it hasn't been processed yet, um, and, and since then a lot of these gray areas have been clarified, 
and you're kind of wondering if you should update your loan, uh, number one, you need to work with your banker. Number two, you really don't want to delay your loan process. So if you if you do think that you should uh, recalculate your number and if it's substantially higher then I would reach out to your banker but that, I think that would be the next step is you don't want to delay your your loan process if, if things are that tight um, but if you do want to recalculate and have somebody look over it that might be good and if it's substantially higher then you you want to get you'd want to resubmit that with a new number before your loan is processed so um, we, I think we have one last question here um, so there was a lot that happened last night. Uh, hopefully everybody was watching the news. Uh, Senate Majority uh, Leader Mitch McConnell said he hopes to approve further funding for the Small Business Loan Program uh, this week. And what does that mean for small businesses? So I'll, I'll just take a stab at answering that. The whole goal of this CARES Act, which includes the PPP uh, loan program and loan forgiveness, the whole spirit of it is to give small businesses a break during this crisis where they're uh, shut down through no fault of their own. So right away when the CARES Act passed, people were wondering if if the 350 billion was going to run out for small businesses. And I think even a as early as the next day, they announced that if that happened, that they would go back and ask for more. And now, and we did mention that on last week's webinar. So I think that's coming true that they're, I think what, I think what they did is they, they didn't have enough time to really analyze that and they needed to get it passed to get things moving and now now that we're a week week and a half in uh they're putting more uh time and resources into calculating uh how how many businesses are going to be applying and how how much in the way of dollars that's going to cost and i think that's what they're going back and now trying to get more monies allocated so that they don't run out because it's not it's not supposed to be a race that the first it's first come first serve. That's not the spirit of what what happened with the CARES Act. They want every small business to get a share in this so that so that businesses don't they don't go out of business and then they retain their employees. Uh, Paul, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that Dan or Jeannie. No, I would just say that, as I said last week, this is not a large stimulus package. This is 10 times larger than this country has ever seen, and that's been implemented in the last five to seven days. So no one wants to get uh, your money that, that you deserve to help moving your business forward. No one gets, wants to get it quicker uh, in your hands than the banks. So I, I think they're moving along well. Hang in there. The sun does come up tomorrow and uh, you'll get what's needed. You'll get the forgiveness and you'll move through. So. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, that was our last question. Uh, we appreciate you guys attending today. Um, don't forget to visit our website at anderscpa.com. There's a COVID-19 resource center with all of our webinars that have been posted. We've had a summary of the CARES Act. We encourage you to go through every aspect of the CARES Act to see if it applies to your business and to see if it uh, helps you. Um, One thing that, I will add, Dan Mudd, in regards to the questions Thanks to Dave Finkling for answering a ton of questions that came in, a lot of good questions. There are still a lot that are not yet answered. We will be working through those. We will be publishing all the questions and answers after the webinar. Um, so if we don't get, if we didn't get to answering yours during the webinar, um, we will address it and it'll be published on our website as well. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.